institution has become exceedingly important. We know that uh, the higher judiciary was created by the Constitution to ensure the protection of the Constitution itself, protection of democracy, protection of fundamental rights of citizens. And uh, in the current climate where a lot of these values are threatened, the judiciary, the higher judiciary is supposed to and expected to play an even more critical and important role. And it is in this context that uh, appointments to the higher judiciary become exceedingly important and we have been seeing in the recent past that this government has been stalling many appointments which have been recommended by the collegium. As you all know, the law laid down by the Supreme Court about judicial appointments is that the, uh, the persons, or the judges will be selected by the collegium of senior judges of the Supreme Court and <clears throat> the government can only return the matter back to the collegium once if they have some objection. Thereafter, if it is unanimously reiterated, those persons have to be appointed. But what we have been seeing is that uh, appointments are being stalled because the government doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't respond to the recommendations. Even if it responds after some time and the recommendations are unanimously reiterated, often the appointments are not made, the notifications are not issued. And also there is segregation of the uh, recommendations so that people who were supposed to be senior are made junior in that <coughs> process, who were supposed to be senior according to the recommendations of the collegium. There is also a concerted attack on the collegium system by the government and its cohorts and uh, this attack has got some takers among the public and the takers have also are also there because even the collegium system has had its problems, still has problems which need to be rectified. And there is of course the larger debate about what can be the best and ideal system. So, so we have uh, arranged or we have organized the seminar in order to discuss all these three issues. So the first session <clears throat> is about how the government is uh, stonewalling recommendations of the collegium. The second session is about how the collegium system can be improved by making it more transparent and uh, better suited for recommending the right judges than avoiding the kind of nepotism that one sometimes sees in collegium selections. And the third session is about what should be and could be the best system or the best process for selecting judges in this country. And, and thereafter, there is a last session on <clears throat> uh, questions that people might have, discussions, and a resolution. We have a very, very impressive galaxy of speakers for this seminar, the kind that I have never seen assembled before in one seminar relating to the judiciary. We have retired chief justices, retired judges of the Supreme Court and the high courts. We have uh, vice chancellors of various law, of uh, some of the best law universities. We have uh, professors, we have judicial activists. Some of the best people in the country are going to be speaking in this seminar and therefore you are in for something which has not been seen for a very, very long time in this country. So <clears throat> without more ado, let me uh, introduce the moderators for the session. So we have Cheryl uh, D'Souza, who is an advocate and the secretary for the Campaign for Judicial Accountability and Reforms, who will be moderating or not moderating, who would be 
uh, anchoring the first session. And thereafter, for the second session, which is on a transparent and accountable collegium, we have Alok Prasanna, who is the co-founder of Vidhi Legal Center uh, of Legal Policy, who will be anchoring it. And for the third session, the anchor will be Prasanna S., who is an advocate, along with Amrita Jori, who is an RTI activist. So let me invite Cheryl to introduce the speakers for the first session and, and invite them over. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this first session at the seminar on judicial appointments and reforms. Um, in 2018, when I was drafting the Center for Public Interest Litigation petition, seeking a mandate to the government on timely judicial appointments. In adherence with the settled law, as laid down in the three judges' cases of 1993, 1998, and 2015, I came across an article in Live Law when I was researching the delay in appointments to the High Court and the Supreme Court. The title of the article was Judges' Appointments, a Ping-Pong Game. And this brings us directly to the title of the first session today. Where there is a settled law on appointments to the higher judiciary, which gives primacy to the opinion of the Chief Justice of India and the Collegium of Judges to make recommendations and pass final resolutions for the appointments in consultation with the government, the ping pong is on account of executive interference in judicial appointments. And this is our first session today. Before I introduce our very esteemed panel for this session, I will just give you, for the sake of the many law students here, a very brief one or two minute overview on the law regarding judicial appointments. The appointment of judges to the higher judiciary has been a very long struggle between the executive and the judiciary for primacy. In the second judge's case, 1993, with a considered view to avoid political interference in judicial appointments and believing judges to be best placed to assess the ability of a potential judge, the Supreme Court accorded judiciary, the judiciary primacy in the matter of judicial appointments. The collegium system was created, nullifying the executive's primacy in the appointment of judges, as was held in the S.P. Gupta versus Union of India case of 1981. The court held that primacy in matters of judicial appointments will be given to the view of the Chief Justice of India, taken in consultation with the other judges of the Collegium. The court further held that the initiation of the proposal for appointments must be made by the Honorable Chief Justice of India or the Chief Justice of the High Courts, as the case may be, and failure of any constitutional functionary to express their opinion within a specified period should be construed to mean deemed upon agreement of that functionary with the recommendation of the Chief Justice of India. The court held that within a period of six weeks from the receipt of the recommendation, the government must convey its opinion to the Chief Justice of India. The law laid down by the second judge's case unequivocally also states that once a recommendation has been reiterated unanimously by the collegium, the appointment ought to be made and the executive cannot undermine the process by not notifying the reiteration by the collegium. In 2015, a constitution bench of the Supreme Court struck down the NJAC Act and the constitutional amendment, declaring them unconstitutional and void. The Supreme Court struck down the amendment and the law creating the NJAC on the ground that by bringing in the law minister in the appointments committee and having the secretariat with the law ministry, the government would acquire the power to substantially interfere with the recommendations and therefore would compromise the independence of the judiciary, which has been held to be a basic feature of the Constitution. 
the NJAC judgment also recommended finalizing a memorandum of procedure for judicial appointments, which, with some back and forth, seems to now have reached a stalemate, another ping pong between the executive and the judiciary. We have pointed out, and as Mr. Bhushan also uh, stated, three ways in which the executive has been stalling judicial appointments by either indefinitely sitting on collegium recommendations or not notifying reiterated recommendations or further by unilaterally segregating collegium reg resolutions and notifying only select names. So with this general backdrop, it is my absolute honor to introduce the panelists for the first session and request them to please come up on stage. Justice Yuyu Lalit. Justice Lalit took over as the 49th Chief Justice of India, not just with a vision, but he went straight into action. His 2.5 month tenure as Chief Justice of India was exceptional and etched in all our memories. His contribution to transparency and listing of cases, setting up parallel constitution benches, live streaming of constitutional hearings, patient mentionings, and the many reforms he brought in during his brief chief justiceship will be remembered by us all. Thank you, Justice Lalit. Mr. Dushyant Dave. Mr. Dave is a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India and former president of the Supreme Court Bar Association. As a senior member of the bar, Mr. Dave has worked tirelessly and spoken out on issues of civil liberties and human rights. He has been a fearless fighter, upholding the principles of the Constitution and a relentless crusader for accountability in the judiciary and for upholding the dignity of the courts. Welcome, Mr. Dave. Dr. Fezan Mustafa. Dr. Fezan Mustafa is an Indian legal scholar and academic who served as Vice Chancellor of Nalsar University, Hyderabad from 2012 to 2020. Dr. Mustafa has been a visiting professor at several universities around the world, including the Harvard Law School, University of Manchester, etc. He has published extensively on various legal subjects and has authored several books and papers in national and international journals. He is known for his contribution to legal education and has been instrumental in setting up several legal clinics and centers for research and advocacy at Nalsar. Welcome, Dr. Mustafa. Senior Advocate, Mr. Aditya Sondi. Mr. Sondi is a senior advocate practicing before the High Court of Karnataka and the Supreme Court of India, and is known for his expertise in civil, commercial, and constitutional law. He has served as additional advocate general for Karnataka from April 2016 to April 2018, he graduated from the National Law School of India University, Bangalore in 1998 and has been visiting faculty since. He has been a part of many constitutional cases, including the re recent hijab case. Welcome, Mr. Sondi. Yes, sir. The judiciary of this country has become poorer because uh, my good friend, appointment was not clear. Thank you. 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 Thank Professor Mohan Gopal was director of the National Judicial Academy from 2006 to 2011. During the period of 2012 to 2019, Professor Gopal was the founder chair of the National Court Management Systems Committee of the Supreme Court of India. He is also the former director of the National Law School of India, Bangalore. Professor G. Mohan Gopal is known for his active work in reforming legal and judicial institutions. Welcome, Professor Gopal. With this, I now welcome Justice Yuyu Lalit to please make his speech. Yeah, I would also request all the panelists to please speak from here because this is being live streamed and they have the mics.
all the dignitaries who are present on and off the dais, the advocates who are present in large number, law students, persons from electronic and press media, ladies and gentlemen. I have a very difficult role to play. Somebody who was holding the office till very recently and was part of the collegium for at least about, say, last two years or so. <clears throat> On the experience which I have gathered as a member of the collegium, I must say that as judge number one, in a collegium which was headed by Chief Justice Ramana, me, and Justice Kanvilkar being the other two members. Recommendations which we made, almost about 255 were accepted by the government, and about 255 persons were sworn in as judges of the High Court. About 30 odd recommendations, perhaps, were not cleared by the government till I demitted office. And about 50 or 60 of them, names which were recommended by the High Court Collegium, were not cleared by us. So roughly, I have had the benefit of, or the experience of seeing at least about, say, 325 names which came up before the Collegium. And my experience has been, and this is where the matter has to be seen as a fundamental thing. See, the judges in this country normally get appointed at the level of the High Court. Very few of us get appointed directly to the Supreme Court. Most of them get promoted from the High Court, almost 90% of them. So the initial entry point is the High Court. At the level of the High Court, <coughs> a collegium of three persons, that is the Chief Justice of the High Court <coughs> and two brother judges who are the senior. <coughs> senior judges are part of the collegium. They make recommendations which are then seen or filtered through the selection process which comprises of, number one, the state government inputs. Number two, at the central government level, there could be IB clearances. There could be the profile of a person is checked. Those inputs are also there. So therefore, number one, the collegium recommendations. Number two, state government inputs. Number three, central government inputs, including IB clearance, everything. There are persons and there are instances where the recommendations are made by the collegium, but there could be something amiss so far as the personal profile of that man is concerned. Then the matter is seen here at the level of consultee judges. In case we are considering appointment, say, to Karnataka High Court, those judges in the Supreme Court who have had some exposure Either they come from Karnataka High Court or they were transferred to Karnataka High Court as puny judges or as chief justices. Their consultation, their recommendations are also taken into account. So at the level of the Supreme Court Collegium, when we, we sit to clear the names, we take into account all these factors or facets of the matter. At times, there have been more than five consultee judges, and there can never be unanimity on a particular name. So one has to go by certain objective parameters when we employ them at the level of the Supreme Court. It is after all this rigorous filtering process that the names are cleared by the Supreme Court Collegium. Very well, so therefore that, if we take it as ground zero, the matter then goes to the central government. 
there could be their inputs are actually taken into account at the earlier level but there could be something perhaps i think they may have something to elaborate on so there could be some objection and those objections normally should come back to the collegium to reconsider the matter now what is the law on the point initial recommendation by the supreme court need not be unanimous it could possibly be by majority vote but the reiteration has to be unanimous and that's additional filter or additional rigorous condition which gets imposed that the reiteration must be unanimous so at the level of reiteration great emphasis or great seriousness is bestowed so far as consideration of the matter is concerned and it is only thereafter that the names are reiterated so reiteration is not something which is mechanical or which is done in a very routine fashion <clears throat> the matters are considered threadbare i may give one example where the initial collegium did not recommend the name the government said that please reconsider the subsequent collegium considered accepted and the person concerned was sworn in as judge of the court so there are cases which could be reverse as well names which are recommended there could be an objection names which are not recommended again there could be a reverse objection even those names are also considered so therefore please consider the kind of seriousness which is bestowed to the entire matter now we must understand the process number 1 so far as district judiciary or what we call low judiciary is concerned the constitution has given or empowered the high courts to be the superintending courts the entire process of appointment posting transfers promotions of low judiciary is completely in the hands of the high court under the constitution itself it is through this low judiciary or district judiciary persons can get promoted to the level of high court judges in fact today the convention has been that one third of the strength of high court must be from low judiciary as promotee judges so who has seen the performance of these one third over a period of time it is the high court alone who knows what is the metal what is the capacity what is the what is the ability of that man over a period of last about say almost 20 odd years repeatedly judges after judges have seen or have sort of monitored the performance of those persons who comprise what we normally call district judiciary very well so are they not in the best possible situation to consider the merit of those persons now take the reverse or take the other side of the picture those who come to be appointed directly to the high court from the bar which by tradition or by convention is two thirds of the appointments to the high court again those persons are those who regularly practice before the high court very few persons have actually been appointed judges apart from these two categories that is the practicing advocates or persons coming from lower judiciary though there is a provision under the constitution very seldom it has been utilized or used so we have bulk of the appointments which are from the low judiciary number one stream and number two stream is the those who practice in the high court now over a period of time why do we say we practice in the high court because that's your regular workplace that's where you normally practice day in and day out your performance is judged your performance is seen your performance is watched by a body of judges not just one or two judges over a period of time your performance is judged 
your judgments are also sort of you know reported when they get down to see what exactly is the matter to be considered to see that the name be recommended what do they see normally number 1 the practice of that man how much how many years or length of practice has he put in number 2 how many reported judgments are to his credit those judgments are also seen i must say that in one of the cases where a particular name was to be considered and a judge in the supreme court downloaded 1100 judgments of that man just to see that whether the judgments are of a particular quality or not now that's the kind of consideration which is bestowed so the judgments how many judgments which are reported reported judgments to his credit how many years of practice and third which is also one parameter which is checked is how much of income does he sort of you know command the reason is obvious that the office should not be something like a ruse he must command something greater than what the office will normally give him and that's where perhaps i think you'll have the best possible talent the matter is seen from these three dimensional prism and then the names are recommended it is possible that perhaps there may be certain kind of infirmities on the personal front there may be a complaint against him through bar council through anything else that part is taken care of in ib clearance and state government profile so therefore when the matter reaches the supreme court collegium mind you it is a full perfect situation whether the name be accepted or not to be accepted so it's not as if that it's a whimsical exercise which is undertaken by somebody down the line only with a view to see that the judges must have the opportunity to select their successors it's a full proof arrangement now imagine whether the executive will he be or will that apparatus be in a better situation to select the judges how will somebody sitting here will have the wherewithal or the knowledge to select a judge in kerala or manipur or somebody else you have to have the local kind of you know inputs which must come from there you must know whether the advocate concern is a good person or not does he know the basics of law how does he perform as a lawyer because while judging his performance as a lawyer the judges are the best possible sort of persons who can say that whether the man commands that kind of respect whether the man has that abundant knowledge about law that he can now be given the mantle as judge of the high court so out of these two systems according to me as presently advised we don't have a system better than the present collegium system if we don't have anything which is qualitatively better than this system then naturally we must work towards making it possible that this collegium system survives thrives and gives us the best possible results and that is precisely why judgment after judgment the supreme court said that very well i don't want to trace the history that starting from the expression whether in consultation with the chief justice whether concurrence whether primacy etc etc that's all history today as the apparatus that we have the model that we have the model with which we work is according to me a very near perfect model of course there can be infirmities there can be infirmities that is precisely why though the recommendations made by the high court collegium 60 or 70 in my experience those names got dropped at the supreme court level why because we still had the benefit of consulti judges opinion 
the high court collegium may say something but there are judges who have come from the very same high court who are sitting in supreme court they may have a different view in the matter so that's the objective analysis that we are called upon to do at the level of the supreme court collegium it is after through this filtering process that we either select or reject a particular name at that juncture once this is something which has all kinds of checks and balances and the system is near perfect i don't think that there is any room for any interference thereafter of course yes that you may still say that there is a complaint against this man there is this particular profile of this person and please look into that matter in the process of reconsideration that reconsideration again as i told you is not something which is as a matter of routine or course objective analysis is again undertaken if through this process we have been able to have judges for last almost say several years and mind you initially when the judgments were rendered by the supreme court they were contemplating a situation as to what exactly forms the expression in the article in the constitution that is in consultation with that was replaced by a constitutional amendment and yet relying on the interpretation of that quote unquote expression in consultation with that was given so much of importance that that was elevated to the level of ensuring judicial independence in the country independence of the judiciary that the amendment was struck down by a constitution bench of this court once the law has been laid down with such greater finesse according to me there shouldn't be any judicial interference with this particular exercise you may still have something to say but on an objective parameter as laid down by the supreme court the whatever be the objections they must be raised communicated as early as possible and preferably within 6 weeks that's the outer limit then leave it to the collegium and whatever the collegium thereafter decides must be followed to the last t thank you so much thank you justice lalit for sharing your very valuable experiences as a chief justice detailing the various recommend uh, processes through which a recommendation moves between various functionaries and the complexities that are involved in clearing various names and most importantly you pointed out how initial recommendations need not be unanimous by the collegium but reiterations need to be unanimous it is not a routine matter matters are considered threadbare and therefore the importance of reiterations by the collegium thank you justice lalit I now welcome Mr. Aditya Sondi to please continue this discourse. Uh, thank you, Cheryl, Justice Lalit, Mr. Dave, Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Mohan Gopal, Justice Lokur, Justice Gupta, Mr. Panchu, uh, esteemed colleagues from the bar, law students, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly my thanks to Mr Bhushan and CJAR for this invitation to speak at a very significant topic at a significant juncture when we speak of uh, the word interference it seems to suggest something overt to influence a process but we have seen from practice that executive interference in judicial appointments takes on a different avatar which is doing nothing and that too interferes with the process of appointments as i personally experienced and lived through i do not propose to speak about the interference vis-a-vis -vis the judicial appointments process per se but i would certainly want to speak about the effect of this interference upon the bar and 
pardon me if i speak of my own experience but i think it would be some sort of a case study for us to try and understand how this executive interference if you will has permeated the bar itself <clears throat> and may i emphasize that we ought not to look at judicial appointments only from the end process or the end game which is the actual appointment process that justice lalit so eloquently fleshed out but there is also the feeder process if you will which is from the bar justice lalit mentioned that two thirds of appointments to the higher judiciary as a matter of tradition though not constitutionally mandated come from the bar and if we are not going to address how independent the bar is from executive interference then i think the latter part of the discussion becomes less relevant the emphasis of this seminar is judicial independence judicial independence accrues from the independence that a person brings to the bench at the outset it's not something you uh, wake up and discover one fine morning and that independence has to be ingrained within us as practitioners and members of the bar and how we stand immune to different influences unless we speak of that then i feel that the focus only on the appointment process is going to be slightly lopsided now i can tell you friends from my experience i was recommended to the karnataka high court in a batch of 3 of which the two other esteemed recommendees were officers from the district judiciary within about 3 or 4 weeks those appointments took place i was segregated and kept pending that pendency remained my file was returned the collegium reiterated it forthwith even after reiteration and in the teeth of the law laid down in plr projects the appointment didn't come i'm i'm not here to make any grievance of it but in the meanwhile other appointments began to take place to our high court from the bar now at that point i clearly remember on the day when the subsequent appointments took place a very distinguished senior member of our bar who i won't name but someone who i look up to and admire came to me that morning agitated and said sondi please withdraw today i still remember his expression he was almost in tears as if he had been hard done by i was still holding on and when i reflect on why he said that with so much intensity i realize now and i realize then that this meant something to the bar to the executive perhaps it's one name here one name there shuffling moving someone back and forth fine that's fine i mean governments do that again as i say i'm not making no grievance about it but for the bar it means something more it is an affront it is a reflection of how the executive perhaps sees the bar as an institution or does not see it and we all know that independence is at the very heart of our practice many of us joined the bar and did not join firms as first generation lawyers because we genuinely believed that there was space for intellectual ideological independence i've said this before that when junior lawyers go independent from their seniors they don't go independent only in a literal sense that you start a new office but you go independent in terms of how you think and behave and i have not of course seen the emergency time in india but in my limited experience which is not that limited it's about 25 years now i have not seen the bar as political as it is today and that is something we need to reflect on it's not to say that political opinions or allegiances should be there or should not be there but my great concern is that this middle ground that ought to be the feeder to the higher judiciary an apolitical independent bar 
that middle ground is shrinking and if that ground is shrinking because of political interference then what future process are we really talking about and this is the sense i have begun to get maybe somebody should have even told me when i was asked to take on this role that you need to very early in your career and i see a lot of young lawyers here i'm afraid you may have to make those choices going forward very early in your career that do you want to be a counsel or do you want to go on the bench and that's really not how it was supposed to be we have seen good members of the bar independent members who've really had no political allegiance who who carry all the credentials that justice lalit mentioned a good practice an ethical practice is standing at the bar a good income a good variety of work reported judgments those many of those were our judges and that rich experience and freedom they brought to the bench what we lawyers like to admire as liberal judges liberal doesn't mean anti government liberal means liberal in approach on the bench a grasp and understanding of matters and of course a relief orientation that ultimately people come to court for relief and not just for advocacy and i am afraid that middle ground is melting away because there is an increasing impression being created and i can perceive it that if a lawyer not necessarily a young lawyer but a lawyer of some some seniority who is beginning to reach that stage and age of consideration for elevation wants to be on the bench then they have to toe the line and if that is the sine qua non for eleva- elevation then what is the independence again from my experience pardon me i am told though i don't know that i had given a talk around the caa which was held against me but i am not a political guy my speech on the caa was about its constitutionality and i doubted whether it would be constitutional i have given a speech about the ews and we have in fact two ews stalwarts on the bench on the on the dais today justice lalit from the bench and professor gopal who had argued that matter and i had expressed as regards ews that it will probably pass the constitutional test which it did by a majority of 3 to 2 are we now telling a younger bar that you don't have the independence even to make that expression i can understand if you have out and out political lean, leanings it's going to cut both ways it may benefit you in some cases it may <clears throat> hinder you in others but even this freedom that we signed up for to maybe speak or write or teach in the law if that is also going to be compromised then are those the compromised advocates who are going to be most eligible for elevation i think is something we need to very seriously consider friends otherwise down the line the next 15 20 years we're going to look at a very different type of feeder that will feed the uh, esteemed institution that we are all part of we certainly don't want to go down that road where the bar becomes pliant a pliant bar uh, is in fact uh, the death knell for the system itself uh, uh, the bar is the 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 stronghold of uh, the rule of law the bench and the bar work together it's not in isolation so the implications of the bar becoming more pliable or more compromised are of course serious in many ways in terms of how they affect the very uh, ethos of our practice i don't have time or uh, uh, you know time to digress into that but simply from within the parameters of today's topic which is executive interference in a judicial appointments i think we need to look at the impression that is gaining ground that the executive is all powerful that the bar needs to be in a particular way for it to be eligible to be considered for elevation and trust me that impression is very deep rooted i can see it and if that is going to become the second nature of the bar then as i said the future independence is in peril in a very different way then even if the process is 
are improved, the collegium system is improved, and I certainly share the view of Justice Lalit that in the circumstances, the collegium is the better alternative. Of course, it may develop into a more improved hybrid sort of collegium that perhaps South Africa has. That's a different debate. But the answer to the ills of the collegium is not to invite the executive through the door. Of course not. It doesn't sit well with our constitutional ethos. So while those conversations and those improvements take place, I do firmly believe that the conversation must also extend to how independent the bar remains in these circumstances. Only then will we be able to truly discuss the concept of independence. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Sondi, for sharing your very real and valuable experience. There could be no better example of how the executive has interfered with judicial appointments, how your own non-appointment has been in the teeth of the law on judicial appointments, and how it affects judicial independence and, as you said, the independence of the bar. Thank you. I now invite Mr. Dave, as a senior member of the bar, to please speak. Good morning, everybody. I must say at the outset that I share the satisfactory optimism of Chief Justice Lalit, but I also associate myself with the anguish that my good friend Sondi has expressed. And I must tell you why. You know, it's very interesting. Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel today, with an extremely right-wing you know, coalition government is wanting to pass in his parliament a law to say that the parliament will have the last word and parliament will have a right to override any judgment of the Supreme Court and that the government alone should have power to select the judges. Across Israel, millions and millions of people are standing up against it. Industry, the tech industry in Israel is very, very powerful and very well entrenched. The entire tech industry is up in arms. Some of the best tech companies have threatened that we will leave Israel and go to other countries. Civil society members, judges, lawyers, politicians, workers, everybody is up in arms. In Jerusalem, all, almost more than 150,000 people you know, joined in demonstration about 10 days ago. Then 10 cities of Israel have seen very large scale demonstrations. And to cap it all, the president of Israel told his cabinet and the prime minister that you are heading for a constitutional and a social disaster. Now, that's the kind of a nation that we have. I still remember and I, you know, stand in awe. Uh, Sondi is right about, you know, the uh, inertia on the part of the bar. And I must take a responsibility because I have been a leader of the bar. We are not really interested in independence of judiciary. We don't care a damn what happens so long as you know we are able to get the briefs and just go about our business. Pakistan, under the dictatorship of Musharraf, when Musharraf removed Chief Justice Iftikhar Chaudhary, the entire bar and the judiciary across Pakistan stood up, fought and forced the dictator to bring back the Chief Justice. Now, it is well nigh impossible in this country that anything of this kind can happen. Judicial, executive interference in judiciary, large scale today, large scale. I mean, with greatest respects to Chief Justice Lalit, Justices Lokur, Justice Gupta, whom I regard as some of the finest judges that I have seen in my uh, career of 44 years. But they are exceptions. They are a dying species. We have large number of judges who are highly questionable. They either lack the expertise, the knowledge, most of all the commitment. And you see today what's happening in the country that every activist is unable to get bail even in simplest of the cases. Even stand-up comedians are unable to get the bail when he's produced before a judge for making some you know, funny comment about the prime minister or somebody else. So, you know, the look at the kind of situation which we are facing today uh, of the people who are charged 
with offences in Delhi riot cases. Across the country, it's my experience now, which I have been observing very carefully, that opposition leaders are being arrested, you know, sometimes on flimsy grounds, sometimes on purely bailable offences, but are not getting bailed from our uh, lower courts and high courts, and many a times from the Supreme Court. This is really very, very alarming. And this shows that there is large-scale interference by the government in the appointment. Yes, there is a collegium system. Yes, the collegiums comprise and do deliberate very seriously. But I must say, I started in 1978 in Gujarat. And there were 14 judges in Gujarat High Court then. And I can dare say, each one was better than the other in terms of competence, in terms of intellectual level, in terms of integrity, in terms of courtesy, in terms of hardworking nature. I mean, all 14 of them were par excellence. I have seen a judge like Chief Justice P.D. Desai, who was Chief Justice of Himachal from Gujarat originally, Himachal Chief Justice, Calcutta Chief Justice, Bombay Chief Justice, and refused to come to Supreme Court because his junior was brought to Supreme Court. I mean, these are the kind of judges I have seen who were exceptional. Today, it, as it happened during Mrs. Indira Gandhi's time, that judiciary is becoming weak and weak. The collegium system is in place. The judgments of the Supreme Court are law of the land. And yet, there are judges like Akhil Qureshi, Justice Jayant Patel, Justice Murlidhar, and many such examples, including Sondis, who are suffering beyond repair. And who is the loser? The nation, the public interest. The Supreme Court has power to ensure that our laws are implemented, power of contempt. But not once the Supreme Court has exercised the power of contempt since 1993. It shows that Supreme Court is afraid of taking the executive head on. And unless Supreme Court takes the executive head on, this interference will continue. To my mind, Chief Justice Murlidhar's place is only in the Supreme Court. He is one of the most outstanding judges in every sense of how a judge should be. He is a classic example of you know, a good judge. But poor fellow, he's not even able to get a good high court. He was, he's in Orissa, Collegium recommended him to be transferred to uh, Chennai, Madras. The government is not implementing and Collegium is sitting, twiddling its thumb. Now, I, I, am, I'm, I have a very serious reservation about what is happening. There are exceptional judges in Collegium. But if you look at the judgment of 1993, the judge's appointment case, I always, you know, wonder, there is only one thing which strikes me in that judgment. The judges said, we must pick the best from those amongst available. Have they done that? In my respectful view, not at all. I have seen some of my colleagues at the bar in Supreme Court being appointed in last 10, 15 years, especially in la last 7, 8 years, who should not have ever been considered for judgeship across the board. And it's really, I mean, I'm not taking any particular name, but the kind of performance that they have today, the kind of judgments that they pass, the kind of comments that they make in the court makes us really feel one, uh, you know, how, how is it that the collegium system is failing in not considering this? Chief Justice Lalit may be right in saying that in some case they uh, seen, you know, ju uh, judgments of a particular judge being considered. But I can dare say that a recently appointed judge to the Supreme Court has not written a single good judgment in his career as a judge. Now, what do you do about it? Who, nobody wants to speak. The bar is silent, absolutely. And the collegium just goes about its work as if, you know, everything is honky-dory. So, my own feeling is that this is not how really we should. There is no doubt that today, like Mrs. Gandhi, Prime Minister Modi is an extremely powerful, uh, you know, leader. And naturally, every powerful leader would want to perpetuate his power and he doesn't want judiciary asking him questions about how his policies are, how his government's actions are. He doesn't want that, naturally. But the judiciary's role, as Chief Justice Lalit said and as uh, Sodi very beautifully put it, ju judiciary's role is to question them. And unless we have a judiciary which is willing to question them day in and day out, you know, it's really... Now, look at, you know, the kind of comments that law minister, the vice president, the Lok Sabha speaker have all been making about the collegium. There is complete silence on the part of the political class. 
Why is it that the political opposition parties are not raising that as a very serious issue while they are wasting their time on La Affair Adani? Of course, they should raise about Adani, but that's a secondary issue. The far more serious issue is the attack that the executive is launching every day on the judiciary. So, I have, uh, I mean, I feel sorry to say that this country has gone into some kind of inertia, some kind of a coma where we are not interested in a strong and independent judiciary. We do talk, look at the kind of, I mean, effort that has been made in organizing uh, this uh, beautiful seminar and some of the finest minds of this country are here. But the kind of response that we receive, that shows that nobody in this country, even in the bar, anybody cares. The Supreme Court Bar Association has failed to pass any resolution so condemning what the law minister has been saying, which is highly improper. Highly improper. And for law minister to speak about uh, matters being filed in Supreme Court and caution the Supreme Court not to take up, it's clearly obstruction of justice to my mind. A West Bengal chief minister was found guilty of contempt when he did so many years ago. So it's this is a situation which I don't know how. Yes, I agree with Chief Justice Lalit that collegium system is perhaps the only uh, solution today. Although I was against it when I argued uh, in JSC case as president of the Supreme Court bar, I did attack the collegium system. J Justice Lokur was on that bench and I was uh, very frank about it because I have seen what is happening. There are many things which we can't discuss. But let us not judge judiciary and its position or its strengths or weaknesses by looking at some finest examples which are far and few. We can't just say that because Justice Lalit is so good or Justice Lokur is so good or Justice Gupta is so good, judiciary is in good condition. No, go down to the high courts. Complete inertia. The kind of, you know, kind of and kind of approach that judges have, the kind of treatment judges give to the bar, the kind of, I mean, lack of integrity, lack of commitment, lack of intellectualism, all that is, you know, very, very present in large number across the country. There are outstanding judges, but they are far and few. And they are the only ones as a result of which people still have faith in this system, in judiciary. Judiciary after the armed forces, according to me, is the most loved institution in this country. But is judiciary standing up? So, you know, it's, I think, ek se tali nahi hai, do se hai. If government is interfering, there is every responsibility and duty on the part of the judiciary to strike back at the government. Does the judiciary have that will to strike back? In my view, no. Unless judiciary strikes back in few cases, you know, all these cases, if they start issuing contempt notice and, you know, uh, call upon the Secretary Justice to the government of India to appear before it, things will start moving. But that's not happening. And it won't happen because, because there is really no will to really take the government head on. So this interference is causing a very serious, I, I would say, effect on rule of law in this country. Rule of law is seriously getting you know, affected. Look at the challenges that minority community is facing today. We have over 160 million uh, members from the Muslim community. The kind of treatment which is being faced by them you have seen here yesterday two boys in from Rajasthan were picked up by some Bajrang Dal activists allegedly in Haryana and burnt alive in their vehicle. Now, all kinds of instances are happening against the minority communities. The alleged, you know, in the name of alleged forced conversions, large number of Christians and, you know, Muslims are being arrested across the country. Judges are unable to stop it. Judges are unable to stop it. They don't get bail for months and years on. So, on the first day when it is produced, I, I give a classic example of this young boy, Shahrukh Khan's son, who was picked up. The FIR, I have seen the FIR, actually says that he was not having any drug on him at all. And yet, when he is produced before the magistrate, magistrate sends him to remand. What can, and the high court justified it initially. So, what can, the poor boy ended up spending almost one and a half months in jail or two months in jail. Now, you are destroying that young man for all times to come. Now, nobody is taking action against that magistrate. The judi higher judiciary has a duty to suspend that magistrate straight away. But it's not being done. So, these, there are millions such examples which we see in newspapers today, which we come across today across the country. And unless 
we become strong as a as citizens you know unless we i mean it's not enough to say that we love judiciary we must be willing to stand up for our judiciary we must respect our judges who are so outstanding and courageous and independent at the same time we must discuss also about judges who are failing us in more than one way now it unless we do that i think this interference by the executive will always continue because you know the executive always has these arrogance that we are perhaps elected by the people and therefore we have a greater right to you know run the affairs of this country they have never read the constitution they have ne never read the constituent assembly debates member after member in the constituent assembly debates and th those were outstanding men and women that india has ever seen they spoke about independence of judiciary they told executive that stop you are not the final word the executive is going to be the final word and they beautifully discussed the role of judiciary vis-a-vis -vis the executive and the parliament all that is now singularly forgotten i don't think any uh, uh, you know uh, uh, many people really read about these constituent assembly debates many people understand what the constitution's nuances are look at it i mean we are saying government after government elected governments are being brought down by winning away and we all know what is the method of winning away 10 20 30 mlas from that popular government and what does the supreme court do the floor test now there is nothing worse than this hypocrisy you know that floor test is going to fail because they have already take hijacked those members to assam in a chartered plane made them sit in seven star hotels and they are going to come and vote for the party uh, whom they have de defected from so what is the value of this floor test why can't the supreme court be innovative and say that no in such a situation we can recommend that those who have gone away like this should not be allowed to vote they must first get themselves reelected then the voting must take place till such time the existing government will continue then only we can stop this kind of political immorality otherwise it's become laugh laughing affair that seven eight governments have been pulled down by bhartiya janata party in various states with this kind of methods and congress also did it when congress was in power governor you know uh, uh, governor is in, uh, in, uh, imposed on the state governments by dismissing state governments congress did it thanks to judiciary then remaining silent it's happening today so i feel that there are many ways ultimately you know judiciary uh, must uh, stand up judiciary can't say that there is an executive interference and therefore we are unable to do it that will has to come from within and bar is a i would say has a great role to play sadly bar doesn't have many prashant bhushans unfortunately and that's the reason why bar is unable to stand up you know and support the judiciary or create a public awareness across the country what you need is a movement a movement where you know people across the country would understand why judiciary is so important because if you see your neighbor being arrested without any justification and yet you are not able to do anything it's and just remain you know silent about it it's the worst thing to do it's the worst thing to do and that's what is happening some day then it will come to you but we are we are just going along so my my own request to all of us here and particularly to you know the distinguished panelists who are here is that we really need to have a different approach to this challenge it is a very very serious challenge to my mind we have lost the plot i am a pessimist and i don't think that we can really overcome this situation especially with the kind of appointments that have been made in last 7 8 years across the high courts and uh, the kind of ideological ideology that has set into judges in high courts is extremely dangerous extremely dangerous we need only one ideology in our judiciary constitution of india nothing else and that in my respectful view is uh, singularly absent amongst the judiciary so unless judiciary buckles up unless judiciary uh, you know really tells the government that we are the final word we are the final arbiter of the constitution you have no role to play and you have certainly no role to play in appointment of judges because you will make appointments of judges like you are appointing governors today i mean look at the behavior of governor after governor uh, look at any institution look at election commission look at cag look at any institution where government is making appointments constitutional institutions the worst appointments are being made today 
Now, if government were to be, be left to appoint them, then naturally they will also fill up judiciary with not even those few people who are coming, good people, will get appointed. So I, I feel that I would request judiciary uh, that it must rise to the occasion and uh, perhaps tell the government ultimately that we are the final arbiter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Dave. The bar has always taken inspiration from the courage of your convictions and your leadership. As always, you have shared with us your optimism and your faith in the system, along with your anguish when you see the system failing, when you witness an assault on the independence of the judiciary. Thank you, sir. I now invite Dr. Faizan Mustafa to kindly come up and speak. Good morning, Honorable Justice Yu Lalit, Mr. Dave, uh, Mr. Sondi, my senior colleague, uh, Professor Mohan Gopal, His Lordship Justice Lokur, Justice Gupta, Professor Raj Kumar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, just one minute. <laughs> After hearing three good speeches, there is hardly anything new which I may add, but uh, it seems that uh, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Are not our judges more jealous in protecting their power, or if you want to call it independence, there are people who have reservations about this whole word independence, than people's liberties. Long adjournments for habeas corpus to which uh, Mr. Dave made a reference has become a norm. One Supreme Court bench even went to the extent of saying that don't come under Article 32. And the poor journalists remain in detention for over two years. Intellectuals and the civil society in spite of its reservations to which Mr. Dave made a reference, he still defended the NJC judgment. But post-NJC, collegium neither asserted its independence, nor in all cases, we have Mr. Sondi here, it really went by merit or insisted on merit. Sensitive judge, uh, matters are not listed. There is now increasingly this opinion which is building up in the country that our judiciary is becoming more executive minded than the executive itself. Mr. Dave made a reference to judges of Gujarat High Court and he said all of them were great and I agree with him but none of them was appointed by collegium. They were government appointed judges. One judge from Allahabad could strike down Mrs. Gandhi's election. You have any number of judgments of government appointed judges of such a powerful prime minister as Mrs. Gandhi was, which were stuck down. Today, there are doubts, many people are already writing it, that if even Keshavananda Bharati is referred to a larger bench, one really doesn't know which way uh, the majority will go. Or maybe they say, like many constitutional law experts have been writing, that basically there was no ratio in Keshavananda Bharati. In England, you had People like Justice Wills sitting in Lee versus Booth saying, we sit here as the servants of the Queen and Parliament. <clears throat> Even a man of Pandit Nehru's stature said it in the Constituent Assembly on September 10, 1949, within limits no judge 
and no supreme court can make itself a third chamber no supreme court and no judiciary can stand in judgment over the sovereign will of the parliament if we go wrong here and there generally we don't but if we go wrong here and there it can point it out but in the ultimate analysis where the future of the community is concerned no judiciary come in the way now if this is what nehru is saying let us not blame successive governments or today's government why governments are interested to have judges who are ideologically on the same plane because many people don't want to say it ultimately supreme court decide big political questions it is a final arbiter of all political issues that's why professor bakshi said it is a center of political power because it can influence the agenda of political action control over which what power politics is in reality all about and therefore they are right if they want to control judges and bakshi again said whether justices of the court like it or not understand it or not care about it or not the plain fact remains that the court can be used for purely political ends in certain situations beyond the control of the court last 3 years at least 5 times supreme court is hearing a matter whether hindus are a minority from day 1 there is a consistent line of decision saying that minorities are to be decided at the level of the state because religious minority and linguistic minority both the terms are coming together in article 30 and therefore where is the controversy about it they are a minority in number of states forget about just jammu and kashmir but newspapers and tv channels you know were having huge discussions hindutva judgment had political implications it gave legitimacy to certain ideology sr bomai was also a political decision you had more riots in the congress ruled states than in the bjp ruled states yet the bjp government's dismissal was upheld by the supreme court rafel in an election year had political implications pegasus there was hardly anything but the opposition was in celebration and that is why you know it is important that we try to come up with a system which is better let us not blame today's politicians on 12th may 1973 m kumara mangalam mrs gandhi's cabinet minister defending the appointment of chief justice a n ray said we had to take into account what the what was a judge's basic outlook on life mr sondi this is what 73 was it not right to take all these aspects into consideration was it not right to think in terms of more suitable relationship between the court and the government in appointing a person as chief justice i think we have to take into consideration his basic outlook his attitude to life and his politics and we now have authors who are saying that in the name of diversity even if there are hate speeches i think all kinds of opinions should be represented on the supreme court let us also admit that there were problems in the second judge's case as well <clears throat> justice punchi in his dissent had pointed out some of those problems collegium system his lordship said is probably the best available right now but why in njc judgment itself they did not finalize mop why this unique exercise of inviting suggestions i think there was an opportunity for the judges to probably read down the amendment 
there was an opportunity to do something there. That opportunity was missed. Mr. Dave made mention to the enemy country, and that's why I quickly looked at their uh, appointment system. They also have a similar thing like NJC, where they have chief justice, then four senior most judges, then a retired chief justice who is selected by the chief justice and the four senior most judges, not the chief justice alone, the federal law minister, attorney general, and a senior advocate. Out of nine, six are judges. And then their recommendations will go to a committee, a parliamentary committee. Many countries in the world have given a say to the legislature in the appointment of judges. Four members from Senate, which is Rajya Sabha, and four members from National Assembly, which is like Lok Sabha. But what is interesting that in a failed country, where today when coffee is for 1700 rupees, two members of Senate and two members of National Assembly are nominated by the opposition and the ruling party each. And then by majority, they have to clear the recommendations made by their collegium. And if they are not agreeing, then three-fourth majority is to be there to reject. I think we need to give some role to the union law minister. I feel personally it is better to hear him in the meeting of the collegium. Let him tell judges, members of the collegium headed by chief justice, what are his reservations on X name or Y name. And then of course collegium will decide by majority. Rather than giving this power that he can sleep over or delay or bifurcate, it's better that he is part of the process. Most names will easily get cleared. And therefore, some kind of reform, I believe, is necessary. We can't be excluding government from the appointment of judges completely. This will not be good. In any case, we have seen, as Mr. Dave rightly said, that some of the greatest judges which India had were appointed by the government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. You have pointed out how important it is to come up with a system that is better, to identify and overcome the various flaws in the existing system. And you have also pointed out importantly, in your opinion, how important it would be to include the law minister in the deliberations as they happen at the Collegium. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. I now invite Professor G. Mohan Gopal as the last speaker in this panel. We have heard how the executive interference is probably the death knell for judicial independence in the matter of judicial appointments. As an architect of innovative solutions in the legal and judicial space, we look forward to hearing you speak. Respected uh, Chief Justice Lalit, uh, Mr. Dave, um, Mr. Sondhi, <coughs> Professor Mustafa, uh, Ms. D'Souza, very distinguished members of the audience. <coughs> it's a great honor for me to be here, a great privilege, and I'd like to thank the organizers, especially um, Mr. Prashant Bhushan for giving me this honor. Um, I was re reminded of my uh, professor, Dr. Madhav Menon, uh, who taught us, many of us sitting in this hall uh, uh, back in the 70s, 50 years ago. Actually, this is the 50th year this year after I entered uh, law college in Delhi University. And one thing he did in Bangalore, maybe Mr. Sondhi has experienced this, is that he would start off some of the sessions for the first year students by having two professors who totally disagreed with each other. You may remember that. And then they would say totally opposite things. And that's how he would introduce students in a very unusual way to, the, to law in their very first year and first classes. So I thought that I thought of him because perhaps um, 
his spirit was with us because we have today two professors who are going to take totally opposite views, Professor Mustafa and myself, and uh, keeping up that tradition of Professor Menon, not in everything, but certainly in his proposal that the law minister should be part of the collegium. I could not uh, disagree more strongly with, uh, with uh, personally with that uh, proposal. But to place this in context and also place in context some of the references he made to the historical uh, material on the role of the collegium and the appointments of judges, I think we need to focus, uh, I mean, he's, he's, he's raised the question of what are the deeper causes underlying the interference in the government. I think none of the speakers, perhaps uh, with the ex ex exception of uh, Chief Justice Lalith, because he is in a very unique position and he cannot uh, share with us or address with us, uh, you know, what uh, on certain topics he, he, he has to maintain his reserve. And I respect that and I accept that. But uh, the other speakers are all accepted and agreed that there is interference. There is interference. And the word interference means not is having a role which you're not supposed to have and a role that is not wanted. That's the literal dictionary meaning of the word interference. And so when we say there is interference, we think that the government is having a role in judicial appointments that it is not supposed to have. And that is not welcome. And it is also true, I think as Mr. Sondi said, that this happens in many in many ways. It's not just through the formal communication between the collegium and the and the government, but through many subtle and and not so subtle, explicit and implicit ways. And we need to look at interference, as Mr. Sondi invited us to do, in a much broader context of de facto interference and the role of the bar and the politicization of the bar, which uh, Mr. Sondi talked about, is I think an extremely important issue. Uh, which uh, I think very deeply affects the question of interference in judicial appointments, not just larger judicial independence, but just in judicial appointments. And so that's accepted. Now the question before us is, in what way, what kind of reforms uh, to the existing system can help to deal with this interference, to counter this interference? And in particular, the reform of the collegium system, either it's abolition and replacement by a, a, a commission or retaining it and reforming it. What would be the best way to resist interference? I don't think there is any doubt in anyone's mind that no one, including Chief Justice Lalit, would brook any interference uh, in the judicial appointments uh, process by the government. When I say interference, that which it is not supposed to do and which it is not sought. So we are all agreed on that. So when we look at the, uh, the problem as uh, responding to interference in judicial appointment, and we look at the role of the collegium or an alternate system, and Justice Lalit told us that there is no better alternate system, and therefore we have to go with the, um, uh, go with the collegium system. We have another session to look at alternate, uh, alternate systems and approaches, and I'm not going to transgress into that area. I'm just going to look at interference in the system by the government, which is really the, the issue before us. And so that there is interference is accepted. What we need to, dis to discuss is what are the causes and consequences of interference? Why is there interference? And in the very limited time available here, I'll just uh, mention a couple of points. First, uh, a set of facts. I did a, uh, some quick uh, uh, number, uh, looked at some numbers, and numbers are always uh, very interesting. There have been 111 judges, according to the uh, website of the Supreme Court, who've been appointed to the Supreme Court during the UP and NDA period, that is from the <clears throat> from May 2004 till today, 111 judges, of which uh, 56 were appointed during the UPA period of 10 years and 55 during the NDA period, which is now eight years and nine months as of now. So we have almost a similar number of judges being appointed by UPA and, and, uh, and NDA. And if you look at this and say, what is the impact of any kind of interference on this, some interesting facts begin to emerge. One is that, uh, now here we come into <clears throat> interpretation, which could be quite subjective, but what we want to look for is, are there judges being appointed who are politically biased? 
in either the 10 years of the UPA system or under the NDA's eight years, uh, eight years and nine months. And let's look, not look at their <clears throat> internal outlook and way of life, which uh, is a very, very complex, but let's look at their judgments and, and look at the, the objective material that we, we can see. Now, when I looked at this material from my own perspective, and I'm not going to say names because there's no time to discuss all that, I found that during the, uh, the UPA period, there were nine, uh, sorry, six judges who we could broadly put as what I would call constitutionalist judges who believe in the supremacy of the constitution. I won't use the word liberal or progressive. I'll say constitutional judges who firmly, deeply believe that all decisions have to be made exclusively on the touchstone of the constitution and nothing else. And uh, I could find only six names that I could put a hand on my heart and say, yeah, I would rely, if I had a case and the, the judge had to decide it, I would have absolutely no doubt in my mind that this judge would decide it only on the basis, maybe in my favor, maybe against me, but only on the basis of his or her best understanding of the constitution and not influenced by any other source of law other than the constitution or sense of policy. Now it's very interesting that this number actually goes up to nine under the NDA regime, in my view. Now, we may dis disagree on numbers. We can all do this exercise. It goes up and does not go down. Why? Not because the NDA government sponsored such people who will swear by the constitution. To the contrary, the topic I had suggested here uh, to the organizers was packing the judiciary to overthrow the constitution. So I believe that what's going on here is packing the judiciary to overthrow the constitution. So it's not because of the government that this number went up, because there was resistance to what the government is doing from the collegium. And the collegium during this period, particularly before 19, like they have made efforts in the case of Mr. Sondhi, in the case of several others, they made in the case of Justice Qureshi, whose name so far has not been mentioned, but he's a great martyr <laughs> Of this uh, of the system, he should also very much, very should should rightfully rightfully have been in the Supreme Court. Justice A. P. Shah is here; he should right rightfully have been in the Supreme Court. They're all martyrs of the system, and um, so. Uh, but leaving all that aside, the collegium resisted and tried was able to when they saw the pressure on the other side was increasing. I think some members of the collegium, not the collegium as a body, it's a transitory group saw to it that some constitutionalist judges would actually go up. And the number was didn't go up by a huge amount, but certainly a few. This is only six and nine out of say, 55 or, 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 or and uh, 56. But if you look at another figure, how many judges, how many judges are committed to go outside the constitution and look at Sanatana Dharma or Vedas, or ancient Indian legal principles as the basis of their decision. They may be religious people, they may believe in the Vedas, they may worship, but when they sit as judges, the first group are looking only at the constitution and the law, applying accepted principles of interpretation. But are there judges who we believe as students of law, we're all students of law here, we may have different ways of working in law, but we're all students of law. How many judges would actually look beyond, genuinely, not because they're influenced by the government or, or uh, you know, uh, they're seeking office after, uh, and sorry, appointment after office, but they would genuinely, based on their own bona fide belief, believe that the real source of justice must come from Vedas and, and the religious text and not, and not the constitution. That number, I could not find anyone actually appointed by the UP who from their work, from their written work, may, maybe one or two borderline cases, we could say they are, they are in their judgments looking beyond the constitution as a source of law, as a source of law. But this is nine after the NDA has come to power that I can count. Nine judges of whom five are still on the bench, and I won't name anyone obviously, who explicitly in their judgments indicate that we have to look at, we have to go beyond the constitution. And that's what happened, for example, in the Ayodhya judgment. 
the, the some of the judges went beyond the constitution, beyond the law, to decide the case, to adjudicate the case in front of them. So this number of judges who are traditionalist judges or theocratic judges who will find the source of law in, in religion and not in, in the constitution has sharply increased. And I believe this is the first phase of a two-part attempt strategy to achieve the stated goal of establishing Hindu Rashtra by 2047, when we will celebrate the centenary of the Republic. Not by overthrowing the constitution, but through interpretation by the, by the, by the Supreme Court of the constitution as a Hindu document. And to do that, the first phase involves appointing judges who are open to looking to theological sources as a source of law. And the second phase, which will now begin, is to appoint judges who will identify the source. And that began, for example, in the hijab judgment, where one of the two judges actually said that Panth Nirapeksh means religion and not dharma and said that the constitution does not say dharma nirapeksh it says panth nirapeksh and says and says that dharma applies to the constitution and and actually says in the judgment constitution law is dharma the supreme court is saying and when he, what he means by dharma is sanatana dharma so he's saying that our constitution law is Sanatana Dharma. It's the first time that Rubicon has been crossed. That constitution law is Dharma. He's not saying this rhetorically. He's saying we have to take into account Dharma in applying the law. And therefore, hijab is religion. Someone sent me a video saying, you know, we are having Homa in uh, Karnataka uh, schools, but not hijab. Homa is allowed, but hijab is not. And I thought to myself, the reason is hijab is considered as religion. Homa is considered as dharma because it is the for the benefit of all of the earth and mankind and all that. So that's dharma. That's okay. Now, which religion does not consider itself as dharma and not narrowly as religion? Right. So we have now opening the doors to actually go beyond simply looking at sources, generally speaking, as we have done in the past, you know, broad statements like this of dharma, to being much more specific and, and saying, we recently had a high court judge specifically refer to Vedic uh, sources and say that that is the source of particular provisions in the law. So this is the next step. Once that is completed in the next 24 years, uh, I think we would be able to safely say that uh, India is a Hindu theocracy under the same constitution as reinterpreted by the Supreme Court. So the idea behind here is to hijack the judiciary and establish a Hindu theocracy. And I certainly do not want a voice personally, purely personally as a student of law, I do not want a law minister sitting in the collegium uh, making sure that this agenda is uh, is fulfilled. When the collegium today, by the first number I gave, that those who are constitutionalists, that number has gone up because the collegium has re recognized we have many members, uh, we have at least a few people here who have been members of the collegium. The collegium has, is not, they can't speak about it, but they're not blind to the risks and the dangers that uh, the country faces. And they are trying to pro to build in some some resistance now because they see the danger. This is the first point. Second point is very brief, and then, then I'll end. It's, I have four minutes left <laughs> before 12 noon. The second point is the core problem here is that our constitutional project and vision is in conflict with the vision and values of the oligarchy that runs this country. This country is run basically by an oligarchy because most of the power is in the hands of just four communities. It all feels. 
they had british and muslim forces to counter but after independence there is no community in the country that can counter them in power and influence and so there is no countervailing force except the constitution and this misalignment between the interests of the in many countries including the the reference to pakistan the constitutional vision reflects the the vision of the oligarchy there is no real conflict between the oligarchy and the constitution but here the 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 constitution deliberately by introducing democracy equality liberty dignity socialism secularism is directly challenging the world view and the philosophy of the ruling hindu oligarchy and uh, that conflict first drew a reaction in phase 1 of india's judicial independence where the judiciary stalled the constitutional program by just striking down one after the other progressive legislation that reflected the constitutional vision in article 381 of creating a new social order not economic or political order in which in which justice social economic and political shall inform all institutions of national life so stalling that stalling drew a reaction from people like justice krishnayar and mohan kumar mangalam that is what we can read kumar mangalam out of context but what he was saying is stop stalling the 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 program and vision of the constitution and krishnayar and the gang of four as they are lovingly called <laughs> justice uh, um, uh, bhagwati justice chinappa reddy and justice uh, da desai four of them together they they try to to align the judiciary's vision with the constitutional vision then came mandal in 1991 and i believe it was not by accident that it was within one the next year of that 1992 that the collegium system was established because it was part of the reaction to mandal to remove the control of the policies of the country which they saw a resurgent obc coming into executive and in, and the legislature and they had to be insulated from the judiciary so a government and executive that would be controlled by by a different social group not from the oligarchy had to be resisted so it's not by coincidence that the collegium system emerged and at that time there was no resistance to the collegium system from the political side they worked together to ensure that judicial appointments were still controlled by the elite and today if we look at the social composition of the of the supreme court we see that that it has been protected without any diversity from a social point of view from a gender point of view it's better but you know some i i saw a very widely circulated social field with a picture of five uh, respected and wonderful jurists five women judges in the supreme court but the comment being circulated in the, in the uh, widely amongst common people in the country was they see five women all i see is five brahmins so there is a genuine concern about lack of diversity and that leading to lack of representation and so this project of protecting the judiciary socially has succeeded and that is a space in uh, that is what is creating the vulnerability and now the the government is taking this one step further and saying look we are going to use the judiciary like mohan kumar mangalam wanted to use the judiciary to align the uh, the uh, the judiciary with the constitution i want to use the judiciary we want to use the judiciary to destroy the constitution and completely um, uh, build a theocracy here and uh, so in this context and see this is a reflection of the bar the, the oligarchy controls not the judiciary it controls the bar and it's from there that the domination comes you go to any high court you'll find there's a small two or three communities that dominate the bar and the and the bench so going forward my conclusion is that it will be very dangerous to give this government whose mission explicit mission is to overthrow the present republic and establish a hindu rashtra any role in judicial appointments we must preserve and protect the collegium because that is our best hope for now for now under the present circumstances this is not the time to hand over the the uh, any power or role in judicial appointments in, into a, a, a government that is bent upon destroying the 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 constitutional mission 
Not that the earlier governments were any different, but this one, uh, this one has a clear ideological agenda. But the, in order to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to protect the constitution, the, the collegium must consciously see that its job is to protect the constitutional vision against attack. And it must consciously choose and put on the bench those who are committed to protecting the constitutional vision against this subversive attack that is taking place now. And the collegium to strengthen the judiciary must diversify religion, caste, region, economic class. In all these respects, we won't have a rainbow judiciary where everyone feels this is our judiciary, we are represented on it. I'll conclude by saying in 1930, in the first roundtable conference, Dr. Ambedkar presented a memorandum to the first roundtable conference where he put eight safeguards, brilliant safeguards for the depressed classes. And one of the safeguards was adequate representation in the legislature, safeguard number four. Safeguard number five was adequate representation in the in public services, including executive and the judiciary. And he proposed, he did not use the word reservation that was brought in in the Constituent Assembly. This is the root of reservation. He proposed that recruitment into public services must be so regulated as to ensure the due and adequate representation of all communities because that was essential, not just scheduled caste or depressed classes, but all communities must have due and adequate representation. He said, we are here, the depressed classes, of course, for a responsible government, he told the round table conference, but we are here also for a representative government. No one else demanded a representative government. The demand for a representative government has been forgotten. And so we have an oligarchic government. So the collegium must ensure that the constitution is defended, the collegium must ensure that we move forward to diversify the judiciary and make it a representative judiciary. And that will provide the foundation for the judiciary to, to be a guardian, not just of the constitution, but of the values of the constitution. How many judges stand up and say, we are guardians of the constitution? Many. How many stand up and say, we are guardians of democracy, guardians of socialism, guardians of secularism? Very few. So we have, to, uh, we have to safeguard the content of the constitution, not merely its uh, formal structure. Thank you very much. I think I may have exceeded by a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan Gopal. You pointed out what interference is. Having a role you are not meant to have. Executive interference in judicial appointments is therefore unwelcome. You re-emphasized the role of the bar in judicial appointments. And most important, you have pointed out the need for resisting this interference. As you said, resist packing the judiciary to overthrow the constitution. Thank you. I thank each one of our panelists for their very valuable time and for their pertinent observations and for this very valuable deliberation. Before we conclude this panel, we just have two to three very short comments and questions. For the first question I'd like to, and comment, I'd like to invite uh, advocate Indira Uni Nair. She's an activist and advocate practicing at the trial courts, Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court. Indira, can you just come up because? Uh, good morning, um, actually good afternoon, and thank you so much for a very enlightening uh, panel discussion this morning. Uh, I was going through the Law Commission report, and as a practitioner of law, um, I am not, I mean, I would like to share that we do not really see justice happening on a day-to-day -day basis in the courts. It is a game of chance. And the Law Commission report, the 20, 121st Law Commission report, has 
spoken of a system that is not really suited to our needs with persons who are removed from justice and somewhat status quo is. Uh, and yet the thresholds that uh, are looked at uh, or were looked at and played, uh, placed emphasis upon in those days were those which we do not even seem to speak about today. For instance, abolition of untouchability, poverty, uh, removal of economic disparity, elimination of exploitation, removal of feudal overlordship and, socio and uh, promotion of socio-economic justice. It almost seems, seems naive today to expect these things from the courts when we go in. We represent street vendors, cycle rickshaw pullers, etc. And very often the opposition is also unfortunately from the bench. So I just thought I'd make that short comment. I also have a question here. Um, we've noticed that uh, people who are appointed as judges um, in the higher judiciary are most often uh, those who have served the government. So where then is there a scope for separation of powers? And where then is there a scope of minimal executive interference? You're almost rewarded for having, um, and, and having supported not just the government, but regardless of the injustices perpetrated, you have actually tried to do an eye wash for two decades. How do you then change that uh, approach when you become a judge and how is it possible to render justice? I would invite uh, any of you, maybe Professor Fezan Mustafa or Professor any anyone to answer this question. Thank you so much. That most of the judges who are appointed, they have defended government for decades. You have to live with that kind of person. You can't be saying that if somebody has been a government lawyer, then he would not be in the zone of 